Good afternoon and welcome to your shortened abbreviated Sunset Safari. You will not believe what I'm going to show you now. Well, not me, Brian. Now, I've deliberately parked here so that you can see the back end of that magnificent leopard. And I know that many of you are going to be so excited to see him. So tell me who you think he is. Hashtag Safari Live, questions at wildearth.tv. We're back with you, our internet audience, our most faithful followers, and we're very grateful for your patience. We had to do a dress rehearsal to uh, the United States just for the first hour. And, uh, well, I mean, this chap made his debut on international, well, not his debut, his, uh, his 2015 debut on international television. Tell me who you think he is. He's killed a female Nyala, just sitting in the tree there. Well, not sitting, more kind of, kind of draped. It didn't, doesn't have too much of a choice about it. And then there's also a hyena lurking about here in the, well, everything's shaded at the moment. A thick blanket of cloud is hanging over us. And that's the most patient animal out here. The hyena's waiting for bits and pieces of this hapless Nyala cow to drop to the floor so that he can eat them. So I'll give you another minute looking at the bottom of this leopard and the odd facial turn and then we'll move a bit forward and you can get a look and you, I'm sure you'll identify him almost immediately. And for those of you who don't know, um, well, I'll give you a couple of clues for those of you who are perhaps less familiar with the leopards here. This is a three-year-old. He's in his father's territory. And we haven't seen him for some time. In fact, Brian, I think you and I were the last to see him with a kudu kill mm. that we had pilfered from him by hyenas. <clears throat> Brent then did see him on foot but couldn't get a vehicle in to see him. And he is, in fact, Brent's favorite leopard. I've never really understood the joy of sleeping in your meal, but this leopard clearly does. And I think this has probably been here for two days, so unfortunately we've missed two days of him doing this, and we parked on a road, we didn't track him, and he was just hanging in the tree there when we arrived. I couldn't believe our luck. Raisa in Finland, why am I not surprised that you got this right? Probably from the smallest spot on the back end of this leopard's tail. Raisa, you're absolutely correct, this is Kunuma. Just about approaching his third birthday. Magnificent male leopard. Son of Karula, an 11-year-old female, pushing 12. She was born, if I'm not mistaken, in 2004, on the 15th of March, I think. And so that makes her 11 and a half. And her consort, Mvula. And that's whose territory Kunuma is living in at the moment. I know quarantine is on in Coral, which is not too far from here, to the southeast. So he's still around, also in his dad's territory. All right, just sneak a little bit forward. Now, as many of you will know, Kunuma is not the greatest fan of vehicles. He does those little snarls. So if you see him doing that, well, don't worry. to us so far. All right, while we're moving forward, let's go across to Peter. I think he's at the den of those scavenging things there. We'll see you just now. Well, guys, um, welcome to the drive this afternoon. It's uh, going to be a shorter one than usual, but it's going to be a brilliant one, as you've already seen, Kunuma. I'm sure, like me, many of you love that leopard. It's one of my favorites. And there was a hina around. James very excited to have found that uh, during the earlier part of the drive before we could have you join us. Welcome with us here on Wild Earth and Safari Live. It's a lovely afternoon, nice and cool, nice and overcast. We're sitting here with, at the moment, not very active Ahina. She was playing a little bit with that youngster earlier. And now the cub has gone back to suckling. So we're gonna stay a few more minutes because normally after a suckle, there's a bit of a play. So after the, the cub has had some milk, it climbs around a bit on mum or plays a bit to chew some grass. He's a young little animal, full of curiosity, exploring its world. So we are going to see if anything changes. Otherwise, obviously brilliant having a leopard around. Hope he sticks around. We are still looking for Karula as well. Scott on the walk is 
Um, looking for as well, we were there earlier. We might head back to Bevorsik Dam. We've got about just under an hour left for the game drive, which also reminds you that we are going to stop earlier. Well, she's watching us. Here we go, everybody. Wonderful. It seems like he's coming out of the tree. He's just... You know, we don't know why he would have done that. I think it's a bit risky for him, knowing that the hyena is there. Now, he's watching the hyena quite carefully. So we moved a little bit forward, and he went to sleep. Now he's looking at us. He's looking at... He's looking around... I don't know what's disturbed him. And I don't think he's going to leave here for very long. <laughs> Lippers are very graceful going up the trees. They're not often that graceful coming down. You can feel the wind blowing. It's quite chilly out here. Probably only about 70 degrees Fahrenheit. There he goes. Now the hyena, the gormless creature that this one is, it has not noticed at all. This is interesting. I think he's probably, you know, he's so he's very full. It's exactly what's happened. I'm just going to sneak a little bit forward. He's very full, and sitting in the tree has become very uncomfortable for him, and that's why he's got out of the tree and laying down on the ground. Let's just try and sneak a little bit forward. twitching his tail all the time. Hmm. What a privilege this has been. So just to reiterate, for those of you who just joined us, and I think that's most of you, of course, because for the hour that we were away, during our dress rehearsal, uh, you didn't see. We were driving up the road here, and we were on the southeastern corner of Juma, and he was just sitting in the tree there. The first thing I noticed were the hanging Nyala legs, and then we spotted him. Oh, this is really nice. Oh, you haven't seen, I haven't seen an elephant for a while, and while this cat goes quiet and sleepy, Let's go across and take a look at them from the air. Wonderful stuff. How fantastic is this, folks, to have an aerial view of this magnificent land and this beautiful breeding herd of elephants down below here, slowly browsing their way across. They are just to the lower side of quarantine where our safari tent is and just down the hill and that's a beautiful beautiful herd made up of a matriarch the normally the oldest and most experienced female with related other cows and their offspring and they're just browsing away it's like a bit of a buffet for them really they'll go through and take a little bit of whatever vegetation they are looking for what's palatable to them slowly meandering their way down potentially to go down and have a drink they feed for 16 hours of the, the every 24 hours so two-thirds of the day they'll be feeding that's the matriarch just there in the middle of the screen beautiful absolutely beautiful I don't know what it is but it's something that we have this connection with elephants everyone and they have a similar the age, you know, we, we get, get to quite a ripe old age together, elephants and humans. We have a long gestation period. We have a very, very tight family unit. And there's similarities between us and elephants. 
And I think that's one of the most important things to remember. The connection we have with these creatures is quite special. But what an incredible view to see them from above and see the vast... Oh, we're just up there on the left of the screen, up in that open plains area. So they just passed by our tent before. Absolutely extraordinary view and we're very privileged to have that drone in the sky. One of our huge tools that we use to see Africa from above. Magnificent stuff. Okay, I think we're going to cross over to Scott and everything on the ground is as important as it is from the air. And I tell you what, if there's anyone that's going to pull it out, it's the guys on Bushwalk, Brent and Scott. But Scott's got something really interesting for us. Welcome back to the Earth, and this is really, really interesting. The tree that I'm looking at is a knobthorn acacia tree, and over here on this little corner, you can see it's been chewed, and it's been chewed by an elephant, and we're going to really break down the pieces of this puzzle as we go along now. Now, as we look at this knobthorn acacia tree, they can grow into very, very large trees, meters into the sky. But this has been fed on by various animals, but mainly elephants, and that's what's stunting its growth, almost bonsaiing it. It's got quite a thick trunk, but it keeps on being fed on and can't really continue to grow. And what the awesome thing is, is that it's been such a popular place to come and eat that elephants have been here way in the past and in the very near future. And here we can tell exactly what's happened. Here's some old elephant dung. You can see it's very dry and discolored. This, however, is very wet, looking like it's very fresh. There's a little patch of urine over here. Difficult to see, but there is some urine here. Now, what would have happened is the elephant would have been standing with its bottom over here, dropping the dung that you can see, both the fresh dung and the old dung. Obviously, an elephant's a lot bigger than me, and its front half would have been here feeding on the bush while it went to the toilets, and that's why it's gone to the toilets in the exact same spot on two different occasions. And wonderful how you can read into the tracks and signs of animals to understand how fresh they are. Now, not only can we tell that some of the dung is fresh and some is old and that the elephants fed on the snobthorn occasion, but there's some really interesting stuff going on here. And if you look closely, you'll see this dung is alive. Look here, it's moving. And I don't want to disturb these dung beetles too much, but here they are. And they're busy building these round balls, almost perfectly round already. Look at that. It smells very fresh and herby. And there's just two here. And these two could be a mating pair that we're planning on laying an egg in this round ball. Now, I'm going to put them back where I find them. I don't want to disturb them for too long, but quite big. This is almost the size of a tennis ball, this massive ball of dung that they're rolling. But we're going to put this honeymoon couple back in under this little pile of dung, exactly how I found them, and leave Mother Nature to do its business, and we're going to send you back to Peter at the den site. Well, um, welcome back at Dahina. Lots of activity and action out there from Leopard looking like it's uh, sneaking past Dahina there with James. Elephants from the sky. Lots of things happening, guys. Awesome to be in the bush with you. We've been sitting with... Oh, yes, Dahina's coming back. That's nice. I was just going to say there's not much going on here, but that's the beauty of being in the bush. It changes in the middle of your sentence. Here's two of the other adults coming back. This one coming straight towards us, coming to have a look. Smelling the breeze is coming from us towards Dahina slightly, so obviously you can smell us. She, actually, more likely. So yeah, I was about to say not much happening, but now it's all changed. Look at that. Some greeting. Ooh, young one running back in. That actually looks like a lactating female as well. So what I'm guessing here, and this is just from a quick look, is that the female one on the right-hand side now is maybe a more dominant female than the other one. That's certainly what the behavior looked like. They're greeting each other now. Very important social interaction. Smelling and sniffing, licking, all part of the social greeting. This is actually very, very fascinating behavior to see. This is not something you'll see every day on safari. Here's another youngster.
amazing sounds they make. This other female definitely looks like she's lactating as well, so perhaps she's got a youngster in another den somewhere. There's a th third adult. This one not lactating at all, perhaps even a male. The males normally very submissive around females. So uh, not, you know, if I had to guess, I would say another female this, but not one that's got youngsters. Scent marking. Got this gland called the anal gland. you probably be able to guess where that is. They leave these scent marks on branches and grass blades. So again, also suggesting to me that it's not likely to be a male. Marking right at the den. <laughs> Little fluffy. Uh, juvenile that eight months or so. This is a younger one. Viem, you know these are in as well. So Viem's on camera with me this afternoon. There's another youngster that's bigger than this one, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. So this is a third young one. Two this size. Yeah. I was going to say, this one actually looks a bit younger. So I would probably put this one at about six months. It's still got that nice fluffy coat. And perhaps what would make sense is that the second female that came in here would be the mother of this one, the young one we're looking at walking away. They lactate up to two years. So the mother will give the youngster milk up until about two years old, 18 months youngest, but normally two years. So two mothers here, two different young ones, obviously the little one inside the den now. And then the third one, as I said, I, I'm guessing a, another female part of the clan. Now you can have a clan with even multiple den sites. And then they would meet up when there's big food available, big carcasses to help or to compete with maybe lions to chase them off a carcass. They will gang up on the lions, you know, call more reinforcements in. Great to see so many of them together now. Another gland marking there. Brilliant. Such strange animals in many ways, but really awesome animals as well. There's the difficult to be decide where to look now. This one is busy smelling. Great, you've got a question. Hello, Dennis. Dennis was just asking there that he's noticed only two mammary glands that are actively being suckled. Um, and with uh, brown and striped hyena, the other two species of hyena, there's a third one as well, which is called the, uh, called the artwolf, Dennis, which again in Southern Africa. But striped and brown hyena normally have six. Um, they don't, as far as I know, they don't allo suckle. Striped hyena, keeping in mind, we only get in, there's a bit of grooming going on. Look at that in terms of flexibility. Um, striped hyena, you only get sort of more towards northern Africa. Oh, the young one is out again. Immediately ducking back in when it sees the other adult. Obviously not recognizing it as, well, well, recognizing it as not its mother, if that makes sense. Very wary of the other hyena still, very interesting. Keep in mind, spotted hyena will normally only suckle one, one cub, two at the most. And just while that one's lying down, maybe this young one will come out again. We're gonna keep an eye on it for a few minutes. And Scott has got some interesting hyena um, story to tell you on the walk. We'll see you now. <laughs> so it sounds like you've been having a wonderful time at the den site with Peter, but it's important to also understand a little bit more about hyena and how intricate they are in terms of their territories and where they mark their territory and how they mark their territory. And we are busy lying in one of these areas. It's a toilet, but it's also a territorial point four hyenas called the latrine and there's an old pile of dung that's been broken down over here another one over here and then a fresher piece over here and come down and take a closer look at it and 
Interestingly enough, hyenas will often go to the toilets in the same place, unlike the elephant we've just looked at, that was merely because it was feed strands. The hyena will do it so that it's an information point, almost Well, uh, welcome back to the den. All three adults up, the, up there now. We could hear some elephant just now, and you, I mean, you saw it earlier from the drone. So we're going to stay with them a bit more, just in case the youngster pops out, and there's still a bit of interaction going on. So let's watch them for a bit. If it keeps active like this, we'll probably stay here. If not, we'll go look for those ellies. Clearly see why these guys are called spotted hyenas. Question from Dennis earlier referring to the other species. The other two big species of hyena, striped hyena, obviously, as you might guess, striped, and brown hyena, again, as you might guess, brown. So the only other hyena species that's not as a descriptive name like that is the art wolf, which means directly translated earth wolf. And it's the Afrikaans name that was translated to the English. And uh, they are also not hyenas in the sense of scavengers and hunters like these guys are. The art wolf is a termite eater. But in this area where we are, Sabi Sands, Greater Kruger National Park, uh, you do get brown hyena. We have seen brown hyena here, but it's very rare, very seldom. They would actually be active, or they would also be active mostly at night. And deep into the night is what I mean. Whereas spotted hyena are very prevalent here. So Jen, good question. Just noticing the other hyenas aren't going into the den and uh, you're just asking why don't they? Um, that den would be big enough to accommodate sometimes a number of adults, but at the same time there's no real um, reason for them to go in there. So I'm just trying to get some beautiful images of that youngster. It's been such magic here for us the last couple of weeks. Um, Jen, so, well actually there's one maybe wanting to go in. But there's no real reason for them to go in there now. I mean, that young hyena uses the den as safety, as a, as a secure sort of place to go hide in and stay warm in as well. For the adults, they are um, they're happy enough outside. Probably fine that we would go in there if a bunch of lions suddenly showed up here. Same for this youngster. If any kind of threat arrived, even something like an elephant or something, they would quickly go and sit at least close to the to the den. Well, um, guys, I think Looks like they're settling down a little bit. I think we're going to go look for those ellies. It would be nice to see them before the end of the drive. So we will see you back in a bit. Well, everybody, Konyuma has not moved an inch since you were last here. Fantastic that you've had such high action at the hyena den. It's nice that it's one of the real advantages of a cool afternoon like this is that those predators, which are normally flat out fast asleep, like Konuma is here. They um, tend to be a lot more active than they would be otherwise. The other hyena that is lurking about here is still fast asleep. He hasn't moved either. Unsurprisingly, the Nyala also has not moved. Uh, in fact, it hasn't moved for about two days. Very kind of strangely eerie cold afternoon. And we know we're not very far from where we saw Karula this morning. Brian and I had the most special experience. We found her on foot, and we heard some alarm calling and went off to look at a termite mound, and she was just sitting on top of it. She was totally relaxed and allowed us to view her from about 50 meters away, so about 150 feet. And she just watched us and then she went quietly to sleep. It was just the most spectacularly special experience. Mm. 
just to reiterate, I'm afraid we are going to shut down an hour earlier than normal tonight. And from tomorrow, I promise everything will be pretty much normal. And we will be starting in the morning, sorry, an hour later than normal. Uh, we start the broadcast. You're going to start the broadcast with us at 6 o'clock our time. We need that first hour to search for animals. As many as we can, get the trackers out there. Nyala, and maybe we'll be lucky. I think I'm going to ask you guys to tell me what to do, but I think we've had an amazing view of this leopard here, and I'm thinking of heading to Buffles Hook Dam, seeing if Karula hasn't popped out somewhere around there. So we'll sit here for a while, send us through what you'd like Brian and I to do, hashtag Safari Live, and your wish is our command. Otherwise, we'll just sit here for a few more minutes and see if he doesn't go up the tree. I don't know. <laughs> Ooh, excuse me. A brief bout of consumption there. I don't know that he's going to do that. I think that he's got so uncomfortable lying in the tree, a big fat full belly after eating for so long. And I think he'll probably rest there until it gets quite dark. And then he'll go up again to stay away from that hyena. He may even go and sleep in the drainage line. It's very safe where his kill is now. So thank you, Donna, Christine, and Lynn. Thank you very much for your comments. Christine and Lynn, you say Mr. Snarly Pants. Yes, he is. He did give us a little bit of a snarl, uh, but he's been otherwise relatively chilled out. And Donna, you agree that he's a beautiful leopard? Yeah, he is. There aren't many ugly ones. I've seen a few. I did a dare in my first meeting of Karula to suggest that she was perhaps a little bit pug-faced. I haven't made that mistake again. Uh, Twitter exploded, basically. The servers went down in outrage. Uh, but certainly he is a totally magnificent animal. And it'll be lovely to see. Well, I mean, I hope we're able to watch them as adults, he and his brother. But chances are they will move quite a distance from here. So, Kiana, aged just seven, how lovely to hear from a young viewer. It's always so nice to hear from our younger viewers. And Judy, you've sent it through a question from California on behalf of Kiana. Um, Kiana, you want to know how fast a leopard can run? Can they run faster than a hyena? Kiana, they are very fast off the mark. Now, what that means is that they go from lying down to full speed in about two strides. And so they're very, very fast for a short distance. And then they're not, I mean, they're still much faster than we are, but then they do get tired quite quickly. Whereas something like a hyena is not as fast as a leopard initially or when it starts running, but a hyena can just keep going and going and going and going. They're designed a little bit like marathon runners, but they're also very fast, or certainly much faster than us. So yes, Kiana, a leopard is faster than a hyena. It can run away. They'll normally run up into a tree because they know that a hyena can't climb a tree. It doesn't have the right claws to do that. It's a bit like a dog in terms of its feet. They're not related to dogs, but they do. their feet look similar. They don't have the claws like the cats do to help them jump up into a tree. 
Turkey. You know, that's what they do. They were chased by the hyena. They're very, very fast, as I say, from lying down to full speed. Right, let's go across to Scott. He's got a jumping thing to show you on foot. Now from one intense predator, the leopard, to another, the robber fly. And this is a very, very interesting insect. It has the ability to catch insects flying past it in its legs. It'll create a kind of basket-like net with its legs, catch onto their prey flying, and then tumble out of the sky onto the ground, inject its proboscis, which is a needle-like mouth part, into either the eye or skull or body of its prey and suck out the hemolymph, suck out those bodily fluids. So we've taken a bit of a look around in this area because they are ambush predators. They'll often perch themselves on a platform like this, which they'll launch off and ambush their prey that could well be flying past them and they catch their prey on the wing. And we've taken a closer look at a midden next to us, which is a lot of vegetable matter from rhino dung. And I found already two empty carcasses and I'm just going to pick them up quickly. Look at how cool this is. Oh, okay, well that shows you how light the grasshopper was. It's been blown away. This, this one's also very light and also been blown away. So you can see its hemolymph has been sucked out. So there's no bodily fluids in this little beetle. This is a fruit chafer. And I'm just going to try and grab the, 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 the grasshopper again. I'm probably going to keep these for Hayden's microscope. It'll be very interesting to look at. Oh, oh, I just broke the one leg of the grasshopper off, sadly, being too, too rough. I'm trying to be gentle, though. There we go. There's the rest. I'm just going to try and cup my hand so it doesn't get blown away. Really interesting stuff. Look at those sharp blades on the grasshopper's legs. How cool. Okay, well, wonderful stuff. There goes the grasshopper again and that's the robber flies old meals a very successful hunter and we're going to now send you back to ht in that tent well poo or dung has been my business for a long time as a zookeeper i think i picked up probably 15 tons of this this is an elephant dropping and uh this is what they normally come out like about this size and it is incredibly undigested, for want of a better word. It's a very inefficient digestive system, and you can see there there's still pieces of branch and twig and partially digested. They don't have the huge, uh, a huge, hugely efficient digestive system, so uh, they have to consume lots and lots of vegetation. Let's come and have a look under the microscope a little bit closer, and you'll see that that partially digested uh, vegetation there you can see the stick in it right here I'll just get my little pointer for you you can see what I'm, I'm just here this is all sticks undigested vegetation but when you get down to something like uh, one of the other hoofed animals like this for example this little tiny chocolate coatal sultana that I'm putting in here now just let me focus that for you there you go that on the other hand is from something called a ruminant and that ruminant I'm just going to cut this in half with a scalpel please excuse my going out of focus for a second cut that open and you'll see inside there all that incredibly uh, ver or digested material that grass and everything in there is very well digested the ruminant has a great digestive system but the Ellie not so much but just whilst you're there I just want to we'll move that out of the way and I want to put a little creature there in here I have a dead creature that Scott found before and it might be a little bit close to see but I'm going to just try and maneuver him in and this is the front end of a a uh, dung beetle and you can see there it's a little bit hard to see but that's the front end they're the the, the sort of football studs just here these ones here on the front legs if you just see my little pointer going in here they're like studs on a football player's boots and that's what he would push himself along the ground with and he would have the, the ball of dung that Scott was showing you before in these back legs. Now those back legs and I just have to get it into position for you that one there and that one there they would maneuver the ball and they're like his hands actually or you can see those fine hairs on there and actually hold on to the ball of dung until she gets that to a place where she can bury it. 
but fantastically adapted creature. The small stuff, what Scott and Brent find out on Bushwalk are all absolutely fantastic. Important things that fit into the ecosystem, uh, always important to the habitat and the environment. And you know what? The small things matter too. I'm gonna to see where we're going. It looks like we're crossing over to the drone in a fantastic aerial shot of, I think it's Peter. Well, what a fantastic view. We uh, started with these Ellie's actually being seen on the drive from the drone first. So that's actually where we found them. And we heard them trumpeting while we were sitting at the hyenas. Only back here, we're 500 yards from the hyenas. And um, the drone has spotted them. We could hear them. And then we decided, well, let's come in here. It's quite thick. But this one youngster looks like a young, young female. She's now behind the bush from us, but she's right next to the vehicle. I'm thinking she might come and have a look as well as some of these young ones. There's about three or four, uh, sort of between seven months and 18 month old youngsters here. So you can actually see from up here better what it looks like, the spread of the, the elephant herd. Not sure how many, guessing 15, 18, something like that, nice size herd. Have a look there, see if you can have a count. <laughs> Fantastic, sounds like quite a few then. Keep in mind the little ones, you might not see them because they'll stick around close to the adults. It is quite thick, so the best view is actually from up there, but we're going to stay here. They are moving slightly towards us. We're sort of up ahead of where the herd's moving to. So I do think we're going to get some nice interaction. When we found them, actually, the one young one, the one young one is giving us a nice head shake and even a little mock charge. So certainly they seemed um, curious about us. Also fantastic to see that they're not even giving the drone any attention, not something they were bothered or aware of at all. So means we can keep enjoying these beautiful aerial views. What an addition to this whole experience. Oh, let's go. Yeah, the young one's coming out. Still thick. There you can see them. Hopefully they're going to come and have a look at us. Young elephant. Let me just go a little bit forward just for this one bush. And then move into that middle. There's like a tiny little clearing we might see them in. <laughs> tricky terrain here for us, or tricky habitat rather than terrain. But thick habitat for us is normally good for elephant. It means lots of twigs and leaves and branches and stuff to eat. And elephant need to eat a lot. That's why you can see they all spread out almost like a fan moving through the bush. Fantastic. What a view, huh? What an amazing way to see things. So I'm, I'm just a little kid in me when it comes to looking at this. Obviously, there's a lot of practical applications, but just looking at this visually, it's so stunning to see it from up here. Highly intelligent animals, elephant, and you can use examples of how they find water or food or how they help each other. And, survive but the reason I was thinking about it now is it's just amazing how I mean these guys didn't even pay the drone attention when it arrived so probably just from earlier they heard what it was they know what it is or they know it's something that they can discard it won't bother them and totally comfortable she's right next to you to us she might even come close it looks like she's curious <laughs> Hello, Gracie. You always have such great questions. And uh, this is a perfect example. With Hayden in the tent there, you were looking at some of the dung, and now you're looking at some of the plant these elephants are eating. So lots of sticks and twigs and thorns. Look at those thorns there. Perfect there. The elephant's busy picking some of it. This is called a common spike thorn. Very tough, very sharp thorn. And Gracie was just saying, wouldn't it hurt the elephant? Well, firstly, to eat those thorns and sticks, and then secondly, to poop it out again afterwards. Gracie, I think that's a very valid question, but luckily elephants are used to this. Their teeth are very big and strong, so is their tongue and, they, and their mouth, the skin is tough. And then they have big poops, wet poops. The ones Hayden showed you was 
was a little bit older, so it was better to look at. But when it's fresh, it's very, very wet. Lots of water in it. Guys, and she's right next to us. So let's just give an idea of like, this is where we're sitting. Wow! I didn't even see this. Liam noticed this. So we. Oh, Liam, which side to look? Look at this. Look at this. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Fantastic. Look at this one, guys. It is so close to us. I could just stick my hand out. That's how close it is. That's amazing. Look at that. Oh, I just love this, sir. Huh? What a way to spend your day. Oh, look at this one in the back. To see it to the right. I don't know if we'll be able to see it. She's having a bit of a rub there against, a little bit tricky through the twigs, but there's a termite mound and she's on her side there having a scratch. Oh, this was so awesome. These two came right past us. Elephants often do this. They're curious, as I said earlier, intelligent animals. So while we're watching the one on the right, on the left, another one came past the right, just eating, eating as we move along. And then of course, while we're sitting here, they know that we're not bothering them. They could see that we haven't bothered them at all. And they just use that sort of feeding pattern as an excuse to come right past us. I mean, at one stage she was so close, I could literally have touched her like that. So, brilliant. I do like elephant, especially herds like this with the youngsters. I mean, bulls are also great, especially when you get to know individuals. But herds like this with young ones, it is, uh... well, I'll put it this way. I would love it if this herd sticks around for a few days and you can get to know them as well. They can get to know us. They recognize a little bit of the tone of voice. And if you spend two, three, four days where you see them every day, you can get some amazing sort of interaction from them. It's one of the few animals you truly get the sense of interaction from. You, know, you get the feeling that they're looking at us as well, as much as we're looking at them sometimes. shake there. Cara and I fully agree and again this one looks like it might come and look at us. Curiosity there and you're gonna have another look from up above shortly I think. Cara just saying it's lovely how relaxed they are. It really is. It truly is to see them so relaxed. Moving around us. And if you think she's close now she was earlier and I'm not kidding when, when her back feet were probably two feet away from the back of the, the Land Rover. They're all spread out. The whole herd is sort of around this general vicinity, sort of like a half moon around us now. Again, you can see this better than we can from up there. Ah, oh, fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. So glad you guys could join us, even though it's a shorter drive. But the fact that we can still have you here for just an hour, so many things have happened. So, um, very happy. And guys, just a reminder again, tomorrow morning, it won't start the normal drive, the sunrise drive won't start at five. We're gonna go live at six, which is very exciting. And this is um, very exciting for us, very exciting for many, many of you as well. There's a long road that we followed. And also I must just have a quick welcome to Emily, Graham. Uh, Graham has been out here, but Emily just arrived today as well. So Emily, fantastic to have you here. This is a big, big, big day for us tomorrow. So guys, just a big thank you quickly because before we don't have time for it later. For the last many, many years, and I'm talking to everyone, not just Emily and Graham, but um, um, on behalf of all of us as well. It's been an amazing journey. Tomorrow morning, it's going to be prime time, Nat Geo Wild, North America. How exciting is that? Free shows and also the the longer drives our evening drives for the mornings for you guys so just a big thank you to every one of you that's been a part of this and a huge thank you to graham and emily and uh nice to have both of you here it's gonna be awesome it's gonna rock and roll uh, i think we had a question hello chris 
Uh, Chris, good question. These illies have moved on. I'm not quite sure if we can actually stick with them. It's gotten very, very thick, and you had such a lovely view. We had them right around us. I don't want to go bunda bashing after them now. We're going to leave them. Uh, Chris, do illies ever get indigestion? Uh, yeah, I mean, they, especially when they eat uh, a lot of cookies or meat pies, they tend to have a real problem. Uh, but I'm sure you understand that, Chris. Um, okay, jokes aside, yeah, I presume so. Sometimes they're not always eating, you know, depending on the time of year and the conditions and so on. Um, I'm sure it can happen. One of the things they can eat then, actually, no jokes, I was looking for it. Here's one next to us, this bush, this guy here. This is, we always call it because of these the spiny thorns that it has, Landrovius flatarius, but um, the Gustacus or sickle bush, the common name, you can, um, you can eat these leaves for, for heartburn. And I'm sure Elise will do the same. It's got one flower, look at that. Here, can you see it there? Sorry, the lights are very good. But this is, they also make these like Chinese lantern type flowers. Well, uh, we've got a little bit of time left. I'm sure I'll see you back here if I don't. Guys, do join us in the morning. It's going to be epic. Look forward to having you there. Nice to have friends on, on those big drives as well. So if I don't see you, cheers. If I see you at the end of the drive, I'll say goodbye. But for now, you're going to have a last look from the sky. And then Scott's got some stuff to show you. All right, but, uh, I'm talking through myself here. Scott's got some stuff to show you as well. And uh, we'll see you back in a bit of this time. This is a massive, massive femur bone of an all likelihood a rhinoceros. And you can see this very rounded ball joint over here. And what would have happened is that this would have fitted into the actual hip. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to stand up quickly and show you exactly how it all worked out to give you an idea how big this bone is and how it would have fitted into the hip. Now I'm guessing it was one of the right legs of a rhino and you can see here this ball joint over here would have fit perfectly into the hip area and this here would have been a knee or an elbow depending if it was a back leg or front arm. I guess all rhino have legs though, they don't really have arms. And look at how big it is compared to my leg, absolutely massive. Very cool stuff, and again, just more bush telegraph, more understanding of what's going on in the past, and that helps us to keep out of trouble and learn from the misfortune of animals passing away. We get to take a closer look at their anatomy and at their skeletons, and learn a little bit more about how these fascinating animals actually work. Cool stuff, we're gonna continue on. Still no luck finding Karula, she's somewhere in this area. I know James is also here searching, and why don't you go for an update with him and see how his leopard hunt is coming along. That, everybody, is not Karula, of course. That is a Marabu stalk, which I think Peter was looking at earlier, oh, but that was on the rehearsal. Uh, he came in, he did the most amazingly acrobatic display, kind of flew around the dam three or four times, just sort of enjoying hanging in the wind. It looked, to all, for, all, for all the money, like he was just actually having a bit of a fly for fun. And of course, a heavy bird like that will really struggle to fly unless there's a wind, and so it's quite nice for him to just sort of hang in this blustery day wind blowing in from the southeast, so very frontal weather that we're having, and it hasn't warmed up at all today. So we thought we'd come here, see if we could find Karula. Uh, I think we've used up all our luck, unfortunately. But a marabou stork is a magnificent beast, nevertheless. Quite unusual to see them on his own like that. I wonder if he isn't a juvenile, or not a juvenile, perhaps just a sub-adult not quite at adult status yet. Then there's another interesting bird that some of the ornithologists will be interested in. Um, and it's now hiding from Brian behind the tree. I'm going to go backwards slightly. Brian, do you see what I'm looking at? A totally nondescript bird there. Uh, a wading bird. It's, um, well, no, I don't see it either. 
No, come on, man. I'm just, I'm just see. <laughs> what is it? He's on the shores here. Oh, yeah, there I can see him. You can see him moving on the shore here between these two sticks. This side? This side, right here. Okay. There yeah, you got him. Right, wading bird, one of the sandpipers, and to the ornithologists amongst you, have a look, see, see what you think. I mean, from that picture, he's going to be difficult to identify. But I, a wood sandpiper, as far as I can tell. I was thoroughly chastised the other day when I called it a green sandpiper. Uh, I was very correctly chastised, of course. I will show you a picture of him. I can find my bird book. And the interesting thing about him, of course, is that he's migrant. So he's just arrived back here from a prolonged winter sojourn in Europe and the UK. And right, here he is. So there is the green, the wood sandpiper. And that's what he is. He's called a common summer visitor. And what put me off? was the fact that this picture has got an ice stripe. And the ice stripe is not nearly as pronounced on that bird as it is in reality. So I think probably the wood sandpiper, short beak, and I confused him for this green sandpiper, which is very uncommon. But it, the, that one does have this very kind of distinct spotting on its wings. All right, so that's the bird. Now, this water is drying. It's drying out at an amazing speed. And Brian, when do you think it's going to be dry? I would say maybe mid-December. Mid-December, Brian's going for. I would agree with him. If we don't get any rain, it's going to dry completely. There were four hippos living in here. Hi. Back in the tent, got some really interesting stuff to show you here and I just wanted to try and say hi and goodbye and give you a bit of a rundown and a recap of what we're going to do over the coming uh, few days. I think this is really cool what I found here and Scott and the guys out on Bushwalk find things all the time, they bring them back to me. We're always finding things around the reserve and uh, anyone know what this is? Maybe I'll leave this till tomorrow, but no, I should tell you. It's a hippo tusk, or sorry, hippo tooth. Hippos have two teeth on the top. You've probably seen them before referred to as tusks. They're the canines. But these particular ones here, these are the ones they do a lot of damage with, and these are called incisors, okay? These are the fighting tusks. They're normally down on the lower side here, another one there with the big ones coming down over here, and they will drive those into the other animal when they're fighting for territory. It's a beautiful design. It's constantly honing it, itself down on the other tooth from the upper jaw, making them very, very sharp. And those those canines, they become razor sharp. So really cool stuff what we find. All these skulls and bones like Scotty just had out on that walk. So it's an incredible time. And what a day we had today. Uh, starting off with marabou stalks and uh, thinking that the weather was going to not deliver us too much, swirling around and a lot of the animals go into the, the vegetation. But then sure enough, unbelievable uh, find by James there with Kanuma. And I haven't seen Kanuma for some time. That kill hauled up a tree, beautiful to see, beautiful pictures and those, those scavengers as well. But again, for, as I said, formidable hunters, the, the hyena uh, skulking around underneath. I'm pretty sure they'll uh, be rewarded from those uh, that, that uh, kill the remains of it hanging in the tree. So we've got a big couple of days, a big week coming up for you. And I just wanted to remind you that we're going to air live tomorrow. We are going 6 a.m. here, 11 p.m. Eastern Time and 8 p.m. Pacific Time. I got it out. And that's what we're going to be doing tomorrow. And it's the beginning of Big Cat Week. We are so pumped. We are so excited to have you with us. All our regular, our die-hard online audience, we, we love you to bits. And we want you to stick with us. And you know what? We're going to open this up to the rest of the United States through Nat Geo Wild on television. We can't wait. I'm absolutely pumped. I love this little lab. It's my best in here. And all the guys, I can see what everything that's happening. It's just one of the greatest things. Things. So, Safari Live is going to go Big Cat Week primetime tomorrow. We're pumped. I hope you are. Stick with us. We really, really love it. It's just a fantastic product. It's a fantastic platform. It's unbelievable stuff for us. I don't know how much time I've actually got left. 
I'm not really sure. I'm listening to see how much time I've got left, but you know what? However much time I've got left, it's all about you. It's about the interaction with you, talking to you live from Africa. It is a dream come true for us to do this, you know, and to share it with you on a daily basis doesn't get better than that. You know what, guys? You never know what's around the next corner. See you very soon.